Good evening. We welcome you to our six o'clock uh, service. We welcome you who are with us, the live stream here this evening as well. We're going to begin with the hymn 349. There shall be showers of blessing. Uh, we've had a good wet uh, summer. Uh, today is awfully beautiful with the sunshine, but uh, this is, of course, about spiritual matters. And so we'll sing the first, the third, and the last, verses one, three, and four. There should be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. And there shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy loves us. Hymn 159, 159, and I ask you to stand after you found it. Joys are flowing like a river since the Comforter has come. We'll stand as we sing the first, the third, and the last. Verses 1, 3, and 5, this old powerful hymn. Joys are flowing like a river since the Comforter has come. Something else, the words blessed quietness, holy quietness, they're the, the words on the course, the course as we start them out. I would ask you to sing them in a more hushed tone, just those two phrases, all right? Verse number three, we slowed the tempo just a mite, and on the course, we're going to try a little bit of choir work. Like the rain that falls from heaven, like the sunlight from the sky. We skip the second verse. We're going to sing the fourth verse. We'll do the same thing. We'll keep the tempo as slow as we've just sung. And when we get down to the chorus, those first two introductory phrases, blessed and holy quietness, a bit of a hush tone. But let's add to it the hush tone on the last phrase, how the billows cease to roll, as if the storm has been mitigated or quieted or made peaceful. All right, so verse number... Four, see a fruitful field is growing. See a fruitful field is growing. Blessed fruit of righteousness. And the streams of life are flowing in the holy wilderness. Oh 
we're going to do is get real tricky. On the course of the fifth verse, we're going to have the instruments step aside. And we're going to go a cappella, or for some of us, a all right? And, but with the same instruction, the first two phrases, a little hushed, and then the very last phrase, hushed. On verse number five, what a wonderful salvation. What a wonderful salvation. sang that like you had some of that in your testimony. Uh, that's good. That's good. I hope it is. I hope you've known uh, the peace that only God can give and the storms as life billows are, are settled by him. A definition of peace is not the absence of trouble. You know that, I think. It's the, the knowledge that there's power equal to handle it. And uh, I know there's some other definitions, but as we deal with the troubles of life, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thought. We'll open with prayer. I do remind you there are matters upon us, people in bereavement, medical matters that are uh, either behind us very near or approaching very closely forward. Um, and I didn't mention there's a, a doctor's appointment coming Friday also. We have two uh, big things on Friday, a hip replacement for one and a uh, I suppose we can just say it this way without the name, a heart uh, investigation on the other, okay? So uh, we were talking a little bit about that today and my mom decided we're all hipsters. <laughs> so I know it has another connotation. But as we go to prayer, these are matters resting upon us. And of course, that the Lord would bless our service tonight. Let us open in prayer. Father, as we uh, come now to begin our service and to ask for your, your blessing upon all the proceeds uh, into the evening as we sing, as we pray, as we look into the very word of God, uh, we ask that, uh, first of all, we'd honor you and then uh, that you'd bless us in that, that you would uh, speak peace to our soul, our troubles, our billows, as we've just sung. And uh, in respect to that, our, our family here has uh, serious matters, uh, uh, some in the rearview mirror, some facing us in the windshield of life. And I ask that as we go through uh, these, that we would have your good hand of mercy and thank you that you are the great physician. Guide the doctors and instill our concerns in these matters. Bless those in bereavement, bring them a peace uh, that is so precious in, in days in, that are this type of valley. And then, Lord, we pray again as we uh, go through our service tonight that your word will be broken open uh, for us by your Holy Spirit. And he guide us in his truth. This I pray in the name of our Savior. Amen. You may be seated and we'll continue on uh, singing hymn 363. 363, it's a hymn that's a challenge, it talks about taking a stand for righteousness, uses the man Daniel, dare to be a Daniel. Uh, the reason we're singing dare to be a Daniel is because tonight we're going to be studying the prophet Joel, and we don't have a song called dare to be a Joel. Uh, <laughs> that's not one of them uh, in our hymn book anywhere, so we have to, this is the closest thing I've got uh, to that. So we'll sing all four verses. 363. Standing by a purpose to heed God's command Honor them the faithful few ahead to Daniel's band Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone Dare to have a purpose firm Dare to make it known Many mighty men are lost, dare not to stand
make it known. Before you turn, I want to bring your attention to a word you sang. I hope you know the background a little bit about this language. Um, on verse number two, many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand, who for God had been a host. You see that word host? That's a military term. It's a reference to a group of warriors, a large group of actually of warriors. We'll find this word regularly in our Bible related to the uh, battalion of angels that uh, God would have. It might connect or relate to our word myriad, myriad, uh, a mighty host. Uh, Captain of the Lord's host is one of the titles of Jesus Christ. He is not in charge of an itty bitty army. <laughs> He's got a massive army. I was studying a little bit on this, and I want you to know um, it would be proper and appropriate for me to thank the Lord for the very large gathering we have here tonight. For the Bible teaches us that while we gather and we are visibly seen by each other, He also attends from heaven. And the host, there's the word again, are. are with us in this so uh, there's a lot going on even in this building here tonight and as we sang this hymn I we don't sing this very often it, I enjoy the words when we do sing it I hope you do too but I took a moment here to highlight that um, and it's mentioned twice verse number four also has the word host and it speaks to the the um, potential for you to be in the same army and serving uh, uh, victoriously, not just serving, but serving victoriously. All right, well, I'm not supposed to preach before the offering. That's how you uh, damage the amount, right? You <laughs> so anyway, we're going to take the offering. I remind you, we'll be praying again for our missionaries in Vienna who are asking for wisdom and direction concerning their residence. Uh, their lease will be up here in about uh, 10 days, nine days. And uh, they need to know what God's mind is. They have found some places that could be available. They're just not clear on what, which, how that God wants. So we'll pray for them as we take the offering. Do remind you that the, the uh, missionaries from the Arctic Circle who are down in Akron are having, uh, the, the wife's having hip replacement the 30th of this month. So the same day that the lease is up for our servants in Vienna, uh, the second hip joint is replaced on the other. It's a big day for us, so be praying uh, for a lot of things here. Thank you for your faithful giving. We'll ask our men to come, and we'll have prayer and take our evening offering. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd bless this that is given, that you would multiply it as only you can, and as you have uh, for the furtherance of the gospel both here and abroad. May we be faithful to the cause, even as we sang this hymn on uh, the great prophet Daniel. May our missionaries who we support around the world stand true and firm. Bless uh, those in uh, Vienna who are needing wisdom on where it is you want them to uh, live next. May it be uh, absolutely the best thing for their ministry. And uh, Lord, help them. Help us too. Help us to be found faithful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. How many knew that hymn? How many know it's a good Baptist hymn? Water fellowship, water joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Hymn 26, it's, that's not the hymn we're going to sing now. Rejoice ye pure in heart, we'll ask you to stand. We'll sing all five verses, all five as we stand together. Rejoice ye pure in heart. Rejoice ye pure in heart, rejoice ye thanks and sing your first banner with on high, the cross of virtual ring. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice ye thanks and sing, bright youth and snow brown. One another here tonight. We are glad you're here with us. I bring your attention to the book of Joel. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, if your Bible is like mine, it's on page 930. Uh, I again repeat for the deacons, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to be uh, tonight using uh, this service as an introduction. Um, you always have to start. And when you get started, it's typically in first gear. You don't go necessarily that fast, um, and you don't make a lot of great progress, but if you don't do that, you stall out, and you lose kind of your grip on what you're supposed to be doing and the direction you're headed. So you have to start somewhere. I, I, I find it timely in respect to the, the big picture of what we call the end times. We just finished a study on Zechariah that had fallen after, or fallen in the schedule after we'd looked at the book of Revelation and some in Daniel. And uh, as part of that whole process, I've been looking at this man, Joel. And so it fits in a timely way in, in respect to where we've been in some of our Bible study. I'm not really trying to be a prophetic preacher, but do you know more than 40% of our Bible is designated for prophecy? And uh, you can't get away from it, and our eyes are on the horizon. We are anticipating the Lord's soon return, and with the word soon, I also want you to know that it has the idea of sudden as well. A sudden and, and a 
uh, the idea quickly is in that. So uh, we are timely that way. Uh, Joel, we don't know a whole bunch about him, but heavily through the book, there's only three chapters. We won't be in here as long as we were with the Zechariah study, I don't believe. But in the three chapters, we have a heavy emphasis, a strong emphasis on farm life. So Bible scholars sometimes think of Joel as a farmer. I don't know for sure. I'm telling it to you in respect to good Bible scholarship, sense that he has a real understanding of, of agriculture. Having said that, this is fair week here, right? So in a short, small way, it's a timely uh, kick into the schedule. Um, and I know we even have some... Uh, uh, I, I was going to say competitors, but that's not the right word. When you're showing at the fair, uh, is that, is, am I using the correct language there? When you're showing at the fair, you are taking of your, live, uh, your livestock and of your produce or of your crops, um, uh, your baked goods, your uh, preserves, I, I, well, you know, I've, what all. And uh, it's a focus on how the, f the farm, the garden has produced. So... As we studied Joel, some of you, should, it should like really resonate with. You should say, yeah, I get it. I totally understand this. And then for the rest of us who enjoy the benefits of those of you who do this, uh, we should, you know, pick up some thoughts as well. Chapter 1 and 2 and 3 discuss, though, more than any Old Testament book, a thing called the Day of the Lord. And all of a sudden, I've left farming in the rearview mirror, and I'm talking more about judgment. <clears throat> judgment. And as part of our introduction, we'll be saying some things about that. Five different times, um, this man mentions it. If you would look in verse 15 of chapter 1, we'll read it. Alas, for the day, for the... And would you read out loud with me the next part of the phrase to the uh, comma? The day of the Lord is at hand. Now, the, the scholarship, and if your Bible's like mine, you'll see this was written uh, around the year 800 B.C., we believe. We're not 100% sure, but honestly, a lot of the description of things happening occurred when Elijah and Elisha were prophets. Tonight, I'm not going to highlight that, but we believe this man, Joel, would have known Elisha and would have known of Elijah. There's a, there's a real, real understanding that's possible. Um, so when you, when you think of those two men, you don't really think of farming, although we know Elisha had been a farmer. What did he do with his tractor? Does anybody remember what he did with his tractor? He killed it, right? Twelve yoke of oxen. He made a sacrifice to the Lord. And he said, I'm not farming anymore. And boy, did he make, make high evidence of that. So uh, in Joel, likewise, the, the, the language and the pictures of a farmer are there, but the focus is on the day of the Lord. Look with me in chapter 2, very beginning. Verses 1 and 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for... What are the next, what's the next group of words here? Four words. The day of the Lord is, uh, cometh, it is nigh at hand, and a day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Look at verse 11. There, um, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his Army, interestingly, the, in the ancient language, the word army there is hosts. To tie some loose ends here together. Uh, the host, his host. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the, what's the next group of words? Day of the Lord. This is the third time we've read that expression. It's great and very terrible. And by the way, the word terrible has the connotation of terror, I'm sorry, yes, the connotation of terror, but it denotes, it literally means awesomeness. We use the word, I think still, when we are very impressed with something being incredible with the word 
Awesome. That is awesome. Maybe it's fallen out of favor. I've been through many generations, as you know. And uh, I started off back when I came to understand expressions. The one that was in my world was far out, man. How many remember that one? <laughs> yeah, far out, man. And uh, we've come a long way. Uh, so here, awesome. All right. Who can abide it? Look with me at verse 31 in the same chapter. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible. What's the next group of words? Day of the Lord come. Chapter 3, verse 14. You won't have to turn your page, I don't believe. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord. So I've read now five times this book as the expression day of the Lord more times than any other Old Testament book. In fact, we believe Zechariah, when he used the same expression, borrowed it from Joel. He would be familiar. He himself, Zechariah, was a prophet. He would have access to the scrolls, being that he served near the temple. He was also of the tribe of Levi, a priest. And so he would have access to the, the, what would be for him ancient literature, books written hundreds of years before him, um, he would be a prophet. Do you remember? How many remember? I told you when Zechariah served. Let me help you out. They'd come back from exile. They'd been exiled in the year 586. There were 70 years of exile. And then they would come home and they were instructed to build the city. They would send Nehemiah to build the wall. And they got tired of the building. And so God sent some prophets of which Zechariah was one. Hurry up, get some things done here. I'm not going to rehearse the whole study of Zechariah, but I kind of gave you a round figure. What was it? On the live stream, everyone's trying to say 500. Uh, and it is about five. So 300 years before Zechariah, the last prophet we looked at, this man uh, Joel was preaching. Uh, do the math here. 300 years ago from where you're sitting was, some, what, 1723? How many know what happened in 1723? Exactly. That's ancient history, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it, it is. So Zechariah got access to some of Joel's writings and his preaching, he'd be in the category of the prophets and he would find the expression day of the Lord and he would implement it to describe the same concepts. God wanted him to talk about this also. But Joel, this uh, ancient prophet, whose name, by the way, means God is, I should ask one named Joel. God is, Jehovah is mighty. He is God, but he's the mighty God. It's El. El, it talks of his might. We're, we're going to be real precise here. Jehovah is God, but it's just a focus on his might, his power. Um, and uh, it, consequently, that's why judgment sits in the front of the, of the whole thing here. The mighty God. Um, so as we, as we look at Joel, kind of taking an overview on the front end, kind of surveying where we're headed, we may be using... Farm terms, but we're going to be talking about devastation. Tonight I'm going to be focusing on uh, devastation, um, and I will highlight it. I won't go into too deep of a detail. Chapter 1 talks about devastation and that there is a benefit in studying it. God tells his people, look, yes, there's trouble. You're people who've been cursed by sin, and sin has wreaked havoc. It has caused damage. It has destroyed. It has not been beneficial for you. The, the benefit of studying devastation is to understand sin's not been beneficial. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? The benefit of studying sin is to realize it's not beneficial. This is not paying. This is not working out. This is, a, as I mentioned in Sunday school, let me shamelessly plug my Sunday school class. We're studying the current days in which we live, biblically. This morning I went over 1 Corinthians 14. And if that's all God had said, that would be sufficient. But he repeated himself in 1 Timothy 2. Paul did not make any mistakes, even though some theological seminarians say that, they're, they're, you know, can't trust everything Paul says. That's, that's, uh, that is heresy and blasphemy. Uh, here we believe in the inerrant 
and inspired word of God. Inspired literally means God breathed. Every word is actually the very word he wanted used. And uh, he used uh, 40 authors to write exactly what he wanted said. And inerrant means, and there's not a single flaw anywhere. It's perfect. Without error. If you think there's an error, you don't understand what you've read, or that's a place for you to spend a little bit more time studying. It really is one of those, and probably both of those. And so, as, as we consider that, then we're not going to question the Word of God. We're going to accept it. Further, we're going to believe it. And uh, so, when God says to us, you will benefit by studying devastation brought upon you, you generally, or you specifically, the, the understanding is you will benefit on learning how sin is not beneficial. It's never been a blessing to participate in sin. Um, I, I had this driven home to me, and I've mentioned this from the pulpit. On my body, I bear some scars. No doubt, you do too. We have, when we heal, we tend to have a scar. And I'm, I'm not speaking of when I visited the doctors or the hospitals, but I'm speaking of of, of some other nicks and, and, and bumps I've had on my body. Uh, I've highlighted them for my wife, so if she ever has to go to the morgue, uh, she can look for these marks if they're still on me. But on my wrist here, I have a, a scar. It's a burn scar. Uh, I, it came after um, my parents told me, don't play with the hibachi grill. And now that I have a scar, you know pretty much what happened, right? Uh, on my elbow here, I have a scar. It's a, there was a cut goes across the, the width of my... My mom never has seen this unless she's been looking intently through my coat here. Uh, but on Saturday night, we took our bath to get ready for Sunday. And, and uh, my sister and I tag team one week. It was her first, me second, vice versa the next one. This week, it was me first. So I went in and the rule was after you took your bath, you were done. You were not going back outside to play. <laughs> I have a scar. So I took my bath and I hurried up and, you know, let, let my mom think. I, she wasn't stupid. She probably knew where I was. And I went out and continued to play. And then it dawned on me, you've been out here longer than you think. And I took off running just as, just as fast as I could go. And, and the shell, I slipped on the shell and I planted on my elbow. And boy, it stung. It hurt. And I got up and I had blood coming down. Now what am I going to do? I can't get help from my mom on this because I'll be bleeding probably somewhere else too. <laughs> so, so I quickly figured out how to get into my jammies, that's what we called them, and get into bed and pretend I was asleep, hoping that I wasn't going to bleed on the sheets too much. And uh, that Sunday morning, I checked it. I'd scabbed a little bit, and I had to be careful all day with my shirt. I wore a long sleeve shirt, so mom didn't see. You know what I was being? Not benefited by my sin. And being continuing forward to sneak. I should be in trouble not for disobeying, not for falling, not for not telling her, but also for the sneakiness of the continuation of me hiding my sin. And I bear a scar to this day. My wife, if she ever sees me in the morgue, if this is not here, she can check here. In the middle of my forehead, I've got a scar. I'm going over the, the litany of problems on my body brought upon me by the fact sin does not pay. It costs. I could have each one of us take a moment to give his or her testimony about how sin played you as the fool. So in chapter 1, we find that we benefit by studying. Uh, let's look, Joel chapter 1. Verses 2 and 3 tell us uh, what I just did. I literally demonstrated verse number 3 by my personal testimony. Hear this, ye old men. Now that's me. Tomorrow I turn old enough to apply for Social Security. So I qualify as an old man. Okay, you old man, give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this, had, hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. All right, you old guys, you stand up and you tell them the cost of sin. You let people think about it. Now, he, 
he introduces verse number four by saying, what I'm about to tell you is worth the old man rehearsing this over and over again. Now, this prophet came along years after King David had been on the throne. There was plenty of sin in the land when King David was here, even by King David himself. That, that man, you know, man after God's own heart was terribly flawed and his family was a mess. If there was ever a dysfunctional family on this planet, King David's family qualifies. Let that be an encouragement to you who struggle on this because God said, I'm going to have my son born in that family. I love that. Those are my, those are, I, that's a man after my own heart. And you look at that family, you read about his children and, the, and he had what? Uh, his incest, he had rape, he had murder. He had more murder, he had civil war, he had violence, he had nasty, I was just, and I don't want to keep going It's Sunday, but by the time Joel shows up, it gotten worse. He's going to talk about drunkenness and that. People were drinking, literally, God's chosen people had given themselves over to their wicked pursuit of pleasure, and Joel's going to skin them on it, but he says before he gets all started, he said... Old men, you know who've got scars all over your body because you're wicked sinners? You get up and you tell your children, your grandchildren, and their grandchildren. You, everyone needs to hear this. Sin cost. And we'll benefit by thinking about this. Some of you old guys got scars on your body. Get up here in front and show them. Let them know it isn't worth it. Tell them. Tell them. That's how he starts. Now, we haven't got the list of the sins yet. They're coming. By the way, I read a report. I don't, you know, you can read reports and is it true or not? I don't know. Abraham Lincoln said, you can believe everything you hear on the internet, right? <laughs> this isn't from the internet. It was a scientific journal reported on the benefits of alcohol. There are none. The latest study, there are none. Absolutely none. None. Now, you might come and say, well, you know, when you get a boo-boo and you're bleeding, you can put rubbing alcohol on that, you know. We're not talking about that, and you're being silly if you come that way with me. There is no benefit at all. But the Bible is clear. It says wine is a mocker. It plays you for a fool. It doesn't say when you get drunk, you're an idiot. It doesn't say that. Of course, the Bible's against drunkenness. It's against the drunkard. It's, it's going to be highlighted here. But the Bible starts way sooner. You know what makes a man a drunk? His first drink. His first one. See, I, I've left the lottery behind, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you get up and you tell them about about the devastation that sin has done to your family, to your world. Now, having said that, we, we, wanna, we wanna get to hope. We don't wanna leave people hopeless, all right? There's, there's more verses in, in chapter one. So don't, don't despair, don't walk out and say, those people just hate people. We don't hate people. The reason God sends warnings like this is because he loves people. If I went to a doctor and he patted me on my back and said, you do everything great, man. You're wonderful. You're a specimen of health. He'd be a liar. I know it. He absolutely would be a liar. And he wouldn't be my friend who loved me because he wouldn't be helping me deal with my diseases, my sicknesses, my health problems, uh, uh, even the age one. Um, the last thing I want to hear is a doctor say to me, you know, just enjoy life what few days you've got left. You know, I don't want to hear, and now do that. There's a day coming, you're going to hear that. I, I watched him with my dad when he first got terribly sick. And we went there and they said, you should take Coca-Cola out of his life. My dad drank Coca-Cola, I like Coca-Cola. And they, they said, no, 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 no. And boy, was he unhappy about that because that's, that's what, I think he brushed his teeth with Coca-Cola. And... Uh, those of you who are kids, that's not a permission slip for you to do something like that. That's, uh, that's not right. But, you know, it wasn't long after that that they just said, go ahead, let them drink Coca-Cola. I'm not stupid. You know what they're really saying? Huh. Yeah, you do. I did too. But when a doctor really loves and he, there's a chance and there's some hope for you, he's going to be blunt. He, he, I hope he has nice bedside manners, but he better tell me, you know, this is your problem, and we will do this to work at it, work on it. 
God's, God loves us. And he says to us, look, devastation. It's good to study this. Let me move on. He's going to tell us in the next set of verses. There's quite a few of them in this section. Uh, devastation. And we're going to benefit by the fullness of it. It's extensive. Now, I don't like a lot. Trouble's coming, but I hope it's just a small little tiny bit, right? Just a little bit. We've been overrun by those jumping red bugs. You know what I'm talking about? What are they, leaf hoppers or something? They're from Japan. They're invaders from a foreign country. And they're going to wreak havoc on anything that's green, is what they've told us. And you can kill them all free of charge, no penalty. Please wipe them out as much as you can. Some of you maybe have already wrapped your trees with some kind of sticky cloth. They get stuck to it, and then you torture them to death because they can't get free, and they try to hop loose, and that only makes them stick tighter. And, um, and, and kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them. There's no good in this. And, and I'm looking at some trees I've recently planted in my neighbor's gardens, and I'm thinking, man, oh, day, those, uh, those critters, they could, they could they could wreak havoc. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope they skip the road I live on. I hope we don't have an issue with these little, little bugs. <laughs> um, and then the, some kind of moth just hatched out, some kind of tan looking moth with red underwings. They've been flying around on my property and I looked them up, kill them. They're to die right now on the spot. Get them as much as you can. I got yellow jackets. They're looking to move from their up above ground homes down to the Holes in the ground, it's fall's coming, winter's coming, they winter down there. I, I keep going through all this and I'm thinking, man, we're being overrun. And this is interesting. Verse number four, that which the palmer, worm, hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Now, I'm, I'm kind of, I was just going through a list of insects that you and I live around and among and have heard about and can know that there could be trouble. God does the same thing. He says, you guys planted gardens, you got plants. He's going to address the ideas of the vineyards here in a moment. And if you saw, I skipped the, I didn't read verse next. It talks about you bunch of drunks, you drunk bums. He's, he's, you're, I've sending stuff that's going to wipe you out. God is in charge of the insects. Now, some Wise theologians say that this palmer worms, canker worms, they're all the same critter going through its different stages of metamorphosis. That might be. It doesn't really matter. Whoever and whatever this particular group of critters are are going to wipe out. And over and over again, verse 7, laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree, made it clean bare. Oh, now does that sound like a farmer talking? When something goes through, he uses the expression cleaned out, clean bare. I, you, highfalutin scientists don't use language like that. This, this is for regular folk like you and me. When I tell you these bugs came in and they wiped me clean out, you know what that means. In the, in the, in the worst kind of English possible, there ain't nothing there. It, that cost me everything. I, the, the, the neighbor's cows got loose again over through the woods. And they just wiped out the trailer park's sweet corn just destroyed it. They had two crops. You know how you stagger them every two weeks. You make a pff, cow's got it all. Got it all. Uh, <laughs> what can you do? You know, I'd say steak. You know, there's only <laughs> if you have to have corn and it's coming on the hoof, I'm not steak doesn't sound like a bad compromise here. If we could work something out uh, when it comes time to butcher these feeders, uh, you know, I don't care if it's ground or chopped or if it's on the bone still. Uh, we're going to have a good time. i got to make lemonade out of lemons, right? But, but nonetheless, the crop that they were hoping for is gone. It's, it's literally smashed. I, I just got this message Friday. I had a man come over and talk to me and wondered what the cows ate over here. And I said, please let them eat the grass. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting weary of mowing three times a week. Um, but as we, as we read this, the, the fullness of this, the, whatever was left by the previous insect was now taken up by the next one and the next one. And when God is dealing with sin, he doesn't let up till the people who are involved in it take their attention and their uh, 
lust for those sins and go to God and in repentance beg for forgiveness. The sad story of our human family is we don't do that. Before the flood, God sent Noah to preach for 120 years. Before he preached, he had a grandfather, great-grandfather actually preached, named Enoch. And after him, there was a man named Methuselah. These all represented God's reaching out to man in their sin. And he said, look, don't do this. There's, God's not wanting you to sin. God has said, don't sin. Sin's bad. It's not going to help you. And it was laughed off. It was ignored. They, they, we know, biblically speaking, they mocked this construction project that Noah had when he built what's called the ark. Uh, they despise it. By the way, most of America despises uh, the uh, ark that was built. There's some men who think they've studied Scripture well enough to have a good model of it. I'm never going to go see it. They charge you money. I can read my Bible for, for free, and I absolutely believe it already. And probably my mind sees a better vision of what that is than they built. But regardless, the world mocks. I know someone who went who doesn't want anything to do with the Bible, but it was a novelty. Hey, let's go see the ark. And in the ark, there is a presentation of the gospel. They were all up. When they, they came back, I got to talk to them. What was that like? Ah, oh, it was amazing. But I got to tell you, we got sick and tired of having that gospel ram down our throat. That's what that ark is all about. That ark wasn't built just to be a crate, a floating zoo. That was built to rescue the man from his sin and the curse. And it was a picture of Jesus Christ who's come along to be an ark of safety for the wrath of God that's coming. But man just mocks and says, ah, on that stuff. I don't want anything to do with that. I, I, and as I say this, I was promising myself I'd be done right about now. Um... So we, 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 he goes through the devastation. I already told you, I'm not going to go in depth tonight. I'm just getting the introduction. Let's see, the third section starts in verse 15, the verse I read. And it moves our attention from the sin immediately to a time that's coming in the future. And by the way, the future still hasn't happened. We're reading a book that was written 2,800 years ago, give or take a year. Almost 3,000 years ago, and verse 15 is talking about something that yet has to happen. I'm reminded of what God told Abraham. He came to Abraham, and he said, by the way, Abraham lived around the year 2000, and I'm going to say B.C., because that stands for before Christ, rather than B.C.E., which is a way to get rid of the Christ, okay? Some of you have seen how they changed the dates. They don't use B.C. and A.D. anymore. They don't want to say in the year of the Lord or before Christ. So it's before the current something or other, and it's after the current whatever, and, and we don't need to say the name Christ. But I don't do that, and 2000 B.C. makes complete sense to you. 2,000 years before Christ was born, God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a promised land. I'm promising you land. By the way, he's the only human that was ever promised land. Did you know that? Land on earth. In fact, Israel, one of their names is people of the land. Do you know what we're called in scripture sometimes? People of the sea. There's a couple of Britishers on this side, Englanders. And on this side, on this side, these ones, I saw the, uh, the headstone for the family and at the very bottom of it, all born, all the members of this family born and it doesn't say it this way, but I translated it. Not in the USA. <laughs> it says, probably meaning in the British Empire. I didn't memorize it exactly, but I just translated right away. I said, so we got, we got people who are from an island nation, which was known as the, the superpower of the world. The first modern superpower. The sun never set on the British Empire. And the jewel of their kingdom was India, not London. And uh, they dominated, and they were the people of the sea. And to this day, my father-in-law refers to soldiers from that, that group as limies. It's a reference to the water. 
They're sailors. And uh, limeys. <laughs> we who are not from Israel are people of the water. We, we're here because someone crossed the pond. We're here because someone traveled from the old country. And no doubt since they got here, there's been some moving around too. And, and, and a jostling. And uh, some of you have done your heritage studies. I don't want to do that tonight. But here, here we have Israel was given by Abraham land. Nobody else got this kind of a promise. But he said you can't get it yet because the people who live there now have not completed their wicked iniquity. There would be 400 years before they'd gotten so bad that God was going to have to kick them out of the land. Now, those 400 years wasn't God just tapping his foot saying, oh, I hope you keep sinning because I got this land promised to someone. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches God was so wanting those people to get on their faces before him and repent. But in his providence... In knowing the past and the future equally, he understood their hearts had been turned just like old Cain back when Adam and Eve had their first son. And they didn't want anything to do with God. And he knew by 400 years from now talking to Abraham, there was no hope for them. And they were going to have to be judged. And he was going to use Abraham's descendants to judge them. And then he would take care of the land. We get a kind of a, a heads up on that because while Abraham was alive, there were two towns we called Sodom and Gomorrah. They already had gotten to their fulfillment, fulfillment of wickedness and God had to punish them. These verses, verse 4 down to verse 14, talk about that kind of wickedness growing and going and going and growing for God's judgment. But verse 15 says the whole earth is going to face the day of God's wrath and judgment going forward in the future. And just like Abraham and his people were used to clean out the Canaanites, for that's the name of those people, God's got a day coming in which he himself, not some assigned people, but he himself, the God, the almighty God of heaven, and he backs it up because we read in this passage, how he uses what we call the forces of nature to be in on it. We find cosmic turmoil. That is, the, in the universe, the sky, as we would say, things happen which are devastating. He talks about dark clouds. We read this verse earlier, uh, clouds of foreboding. The other night, I looked up in the sky, I saw a knife-edge cloud. I'd never seen one like that before. kind of unsettled me. I would keep telling myself, it's just a cloud. And I kept looking at it. It's just a cloud. It's not going to hurt you. I kept looking at it. There's been some other clouds that have come along. One time the sky turned green. You know what happens when the sky turns green, right? Head for your basement or your bathtub, right? Green sky is bad sky. And uh, so we, we're aware of this. This, it, this is, God does this stuff. Man doesn't have the cleverness to have global warming. Violent weather. Right now as I speak, they've shut down Southern California. First hurricane... Not of the season. The first, have I heard? Of, have I? Am I right? When I, those of you who are weather people, is this the first hurricane in Southern California? And of all things, Hillary. Um, folks, I, because of what I promised myself, I, I don't want to say much more. But we can benefit by studying it. We can benefit, benefit by the fullness of it. But we can benefit. And, and, and verse 15 going on, the reason this is presented is so that people will repent. And so I have to tell you, devastation. There's benefit by repentance because of it. God says, look, you still have hope. I myself have not come off of my throne in my position as the captain of the Lord's host to deal with wickedness. Till I show up, you have a chance to repent. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. You have a hope. 
Now, I've, I've tried to let you study it and see you've not been benefited by sin. I've, I've let you see the extensiveness of what that devastation is. And I don't care if it's little insects walking across the ground, devouring everything you've got, or bigger animals coming in and devouring everything you've got, or something else coming along and wiping you out. It doesn't matter. It, it's, you must understand I'm not playing with sin. And I'm not playing around with sinners. And there's a day coming in which you will see that. But till I show up, I offer to you the privilege and the opportunity to repent. And in that kind of concept of devastation, we have hope. If in your heart you've, you recognize sin and you recognize guilt, I would tell you, don't fool around with God on this. Thank him that he has sent to you some consciousness of your wickedness. Thank God he's tendered your heart in such a way that you're aware I'm, I'm not right before God. Thank him that he has not yet come himself in such judgment upon this creation man for all his wickedness and ask him for forgiveness. Joel, I think, was a farmer because he got right to it. He wasn't pussyfooting around. I know we've, we've seen... Uh, what, 20 verses? But if you've ever been around a farmer, if there's a problem, they don't stand around and say, well, the problem's over here. And they say, well, over here, I got this. And they get right to it. Here's where the problem is. Let's get right to it. They don't, I mean, you, you only have so much time. You only have so many hours in the day. You got a lot of things going on. Let's get to it. And Joel does that. And, and consequently, we're benefited by such an insight of this great prophet, Joel. He, he jumps right into it. He says, sin is bad. You all have scars to prove it. We have evidence of it. And God says he's coming to deal with it. Before he shows up, you have a chance to repent. Amen. What a way to introduce the book of Joel. Let us pray. And Heavenly Father, I'm out of time. And as we consider where we're headed, Lord willing, in the several weeks in front of us, the study of this, this preacher, Long time ago, preacher, but nonetheless, his word still stands. His, his truth is, is right down the line. He, he literally uses words that we see happening before our own eyes. Consequently, this timeless message is for us to benefit by too. And, and recognizing sin has not been a friend of the man. Sin has been a curse. And on top of all of that, the God of heaven hates it. And someday will himself come and step into it, that day of the Lord. Oh, I pray that everyone in this room is ready for the day of the Lord. But if not, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their hearts. Even with your heads bowed and eyes shut, maybe tonight the Lord is talking to you, saying, look, this is, you. This is for you. I've prepared to such a way that I wanted you to hear this tonight. I, I want you to repent of your sin. I want you to ask me to forgive you. And I want to come and give you hope. If tonight, as I've just summarized quickly this prophet, and we looked very rapidly at chapter one, not studying it yet like we will, God has still touched your heart. Oh, I would encourage you then to say, Lord, that's me. I've never made things right with you. I carry in my heart sin. I understand the guilt. And oh, that I could have deliverance, that I could be free of this, that I could have forgiveness, especially the forgiveness that comes from the God of heaven. If tonight that describes you, I would ask where you sit right now, you bow your head in your heart and say quietly just to yourself, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Forgive me for my sin. Give me a new heart. And help me as you pronounce your wrath upon sin to be a child of your mercy. If you could pray those words, really meaning them, I would encourage you still in the quietness of your heart to say in Jesus' name, amen. Bible tells us that we ask those things in his name. He will, he will answer. He will supply. Further, he is anxious that no man perish, but that all would come to a place of forgiveness. And he offers it freely. 
and he gives it happily. And he did not want any to perish in their sin. And so he sent men like Joel and other prophets to proclaim the truth. Sin is bad, but there is a measure of repentance granted. And I would pray to God that you would make it right tonight with him. Whether in the building here or on the live stream, that you would make things right. And Father, in a moment we're going to sing our hymn, a hymn of invitation, a hymn of closing. But if you would be so kind as to draw that particular one who is struggling in this area to yourself, I that you would do so. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. And having said that, I invite you to take your hymn book to hymn 235. Hymn 235. We're going to stand and sing this hymn we've been singing regularly in this summer months. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. That's usually the problem between getting forgiveness and continuing in our sin. We're just holding on to our pride. Well, tonight, let it go. Father, we pray that you continue to work in all our hearts, especially those who are still uh, uh, struggling in this, that, that uh, are saying things like, well, maybe tomorrow or maybe some other convenient time. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would impress them that now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. And the chance for forgiveness and repentance is offered freely right at this moment. Oh, that people would take advantage of it. We thank you for this prophet Joel. And as we study the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath upon sin and those who unrepentant sinners, may our hearts be struck. And may this great message so impress us that we continue to serve our Lord faithfully. Bless us with our departure. Keep us safe on our highways to our appointed uh, locations. And then bring us back, Lord willing, on Wednesday for a time of prayer. Bless us now, and I pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, amen. Good evening. God bless you.